you know, I was discovered by Ice Cube in my senior year at Washington. Ice Cube was leaving NWA and looking for an artist, yes. When you really care, it shows. And that's what you did to Washington because we had so much trouble. You came in, a man from New Orleans, with so much soul and so much heart, and you were so light-skinned. <laughs> It changed because no one saw a light-skinned man have that much love for black kids in this community. And he did, and he was so straightforward. Yeah, you know, because I'm just being honest. See, they, he was so straightforward yeah. that it was so receptive. Yeah. You know, and I'm just proud to be a product of what you've created along with my, um, my alumni. Yes, yes. Thank you. Real quick, to add on to what you said about he is so straightforward, and he knew us all by name. I will never, ever forget. Y'all remember that song, The Men All Calls? <laughs> so I was choreographing at the time, and I had choreographed all the song leaders and everything, and we had this whole big that we were doing, and we dropped on the floor, this, that, and the other. We, I mean, we were working it, you know what I mean? We were, we were ahead of our time. Mr. McKenna said, um, I need to know who put this number together. <laughs> um, Wendy, it's not in good taste. And um, I suggest you change it. Because we were in the gym, we were killing it. You know, it was, uh, it was one of the basketball games and everything. But I thank you for that. Because it wasn't like we were out there too much. It was just, it just wasn't appropriate. You know what I mean? And sometimes you need a principal to tell you that at the time, because we did not, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to come full circle again and bring you back up to a little more history and some reality. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Wendy, I knew Wendy was going to be a star when she was either 10th or 11th grade. I can't remember what it was. There was a, we had a program during the middle of the day. It was a, an assembly. And the singer named Richard Dimples Fields. Yeah, Richard <laughs> Dimples Fields. Came to the school, and he was singing one of these ballads and all this sexy stuff, you know. And for whatever reason, Wendy decided to go out on stage while he was singing. He was singing one, <laughs> one of his hits. I don't remember. And she just brought her hips out there and started grooving with the man like she was a professional and they had rehearsed this. And she was all, and the kids were going, wow. And I'm walking up in the aisles making sure everybody's, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the auditorium, people are behind stage and I'm out in the, in the audience making sure the kids are sitting down and all this kind of stuff. And she was going buck wild up there and I'm saying, how am I gonna stop this girl? Look at her up there. And the kids were enjoying it so much you know, if, if I'd have been the sand man with the hook, I'd have gone out there and grabbed her. Oh, but I couldn't get to her. But I mean, she was carrying on. I said, that girl's got style. She oh, can God. sing, she can dance. She was putting on a show. I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't have the heart to grab her off the stage. I just let her It was the there. monologue. I it was Betty Wright's monologue. Y'all remember and, that? Now, who is this? That had to be looking so good, Mr. Looking so good. But yeah. now on, this house is where you do the And she was carrying on. It, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I had to, I had to concede. I said, I couldn't stop but let her go. She's doing her thing. I said, that girl's going to be a star someday. And, and it turned out that way. Let me bring you up to, uh, up to there were mentions of some teachers. Let me tell you about the real tough part of this. Um, I was in heaven being at Washington because I was raised segregated. I never had a white classmate in my life from kindergarten through Xavier University, which is a historically black college. I had mostly black teachers. I had some white teachers when I went to Catholic school, some priests, uh, and at Xavier there were some priests. Um, when people told me, when I came to Washington, these kids can't learn, and these are some black teachers that told me that, I inherited 113 faculty members when I came to Washington. After the th into, entering into the third year, 100 of them had left. Wow. They couldn't stand me. Wow. And that was good for me because I got to hire some different people. And I got to hire people who cared about kids. And I had to say to the district, don't send me some leftover teachers. I will not accept them. Wow. 
I want top quality people. So I went downtown and looked in the files myself and started recruiting people out of the files that were downtown on the weekend I would do this to grab them before they sent them out to the valley and I got what was left. The quality of a school has a lot to do with who the teachers are. So I found Ms. Kruger over at Bret Hart. I found Mr. Nige, the people you're talking about. I found Ms. Dupass. Ms. Dupass brought her daughter to, to Washington Prep. P, uh, P, uh, Beatrice Dupass was her name, but Patrice is her daughter. Patrice is now an engineer. She went to Howard on a full, uh, was it Howard? I think it was Howard, on a full scholarship. Um, one of the proudest moments in my life, it still it chokes me up right now. The students would vote every year on the outstanding teacher. I let them give them some criteria. And this particular year, Ms. Dupass became the outstanding teacher. Yeah. It wasn't just the most popular teacher, it had some criteria. And the seniors got to vote. And we had graduations on the football field. And the people were in the stands facing the graduates on the, and we put the chairs out there on the stage and the platform, I'd pay for all of that. And the graduates would come through one, one um, goalpost, and the faculty and other graduates would come from the other. The, the teacher of the year would come through one goalpost and come to the 50-yard line and then come forward. Through the other goalpost would come the valedictorian. That particular year, I can't remember which year it was. Was it 83? Ms. Dupass was the outstanding teacher, and, and Patrice Dupass was the valedictorian. Wow. So they met each other at the 50-yard line and came forward. Wow. Even today, I feel this was really something. And I realized that the school was changing in a way that the teachers would bring their own children to that school. Yeah. When you bring your own child yes. to the school in which you work, that is a primary criteria for this must be a place to be. Yeah. The teachers don't have to avoid the school. And the community, the community began to believe that this is a place you can feel safe. Um, Washington became a sanctuary for all kinds of creativity that could go on, where black kids, and I was unapologetic about that, black kids could be themselves and not be scaring people because they were loud. I mean, as our culture, we're loud about a lot of things. We're loud when we're happy, we're loud when we cry. We're loud when we grieve, right? We're loud when we make love. We're loud when we fight. We're loud in the hallways. But when you get in that classroom, that's where you're supposed to be on time with, with education. And the quad at lunchtime was always jumping. And the students always, knew yeah. if, you didn't, if you didn't act right, you couldn't get the music on the quad. Because right. music on the quad, they'd hang out in the quad. They'd, it was a wonderful place to be at lunchtime on the quad. I'd hang out there with them too, right? Sometimes I didn't even get to eat lunch, right? I just said they're having a good time with them. They had they enjoyed being in school, and it was wonderful to watch them grow and bond with each other. We did have this family atmosphere. We even had buttons that said "We are family," right? Yeah. And that was our motto. We had a woman there. These kids may not remember all of that. Named Margaret Wright. Mrs. Wright was an icon in the community. She passed on, and she started the concept of "We are family," and I built it into this thing. Margaret Wright was such an activist, and most of you wouldn't know this. In the 60s, in 1965, there were only two black principals at high school or middle school. At Jordan High School was a guy named Isaac McClellan, and I worked at Jordan High School during the watch rides. Carver Junior High had a guy named Llewellyn Mazik. After the watch rides, Margaret Wright made a drag down the steps of manual arts because there were no black principals. And before you knew it, about eight of the schools had black principals. Margaret Wright was such an activist, she ran for vice president of the United States in 1964 on the Peace and Freedom Party, wow. right? With Benjamin Spock, right? As the president, as the presidential candidate. Well, obviously they didn't win, right? But that's how active, much of an activist she was. And when she decided that Washington needed another principal, she told the people downtown, you better bring the right principal in here. And when I came in there, I had never been a principal in my life. I was the vice principal at Dorsey. I go into Washington, and she told me literally, and she had a big gravelly voice, and she ran the parent center. We had parents in there making phone calls all day long, getting other parents to come. So parents were always on campus. And kids would say, oh, your mama said, well, your mama gonna be here tomorrow, so why are you laughing at me, right? <laughs> 
She told me, McKenna, if you don't act right, I'm going to kick your ass too. That's what she told me. <laughs> we got along wonderfully well, right? And the people downtown were scared of her. And when she died, her family asked me to eulogize her. And her will said, well, the only one she wanted to speak at her funeral was McKenna, right? And I did. I spoke on her behalf. She was a wonderful woman. And she knew how to deal with the politics and how to push the system to serve African-American kids. I was in heaven because I didn't know anything but a black environment. The Latinos were a smaller percentage of kids. They didn't get in the way. They just, you know, they were there. They were a smaller percentage. And when I told you we had 2,800 students and 2,500 of them were black, the rest were Latino. They had no white children. Not one white child was ever there while I was there. So I was never trying to integrate the school because I never was integrated myself. I would rather be segregated and well-educated than integrated and miseducated. Wow. So I know, I knew the difference because I had been segregated in the South. I knew that you could get a powerful education and you didn't have to be afraid because you're surrounded by black people. And if you're afraid of kids, you can't teach them. Wow. You don't have to make students afraid of you. You have to let them tell them they have to love you and you have to tell them that you love them. And I remember when I would have some of these male assemblies, I had all male assemblies and all female assemblies. And I would always tell the boys, if you want to go back to class, go ahead. The girls are waiting on you next tomorrow. They'll be. And I tell the girl, you want to be in here with me? Go back up. Nobody else but me in there. No other teacher, just me and the students. And they had microphones. They could ask me questions. We'd talk about everything, raw stuff. They could ask me anything. It didn't matter. They could ask about, about love, fighting, drugs, sex, the Crips. Who got pregnant? This and that. We started a peer counseling program yes. where students could talk to each other about anything. Adrian Bosley sitting out there, she was one of our greatest advocates for student uh, empowerment and students talking to each other.